The celebrated historian, Lord Acton, in a letter to a friend of his, said about Jean-Jacques Rousseau that he produced more effect with his pen than Aristotle or Cicero or St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas or any other man who ever lived. And this observation, although obviously exaggerated, nevertheless conveys something which is not totally untrue. Against this may be cited the remark of Madame de Stahl, <coughs> who said, Rousseau said nothing new, but set everything on fire. What constitutes the greatness of Rousseau? Why is he regarded as an important thinker? What did he say? Did he make any new or original discovery? Did he really say nothing new? Is Madame de Stahl right? And if he didn't, how was it that such a remark as Lord Acton's could be applied to him at all? Some say it is only his wonderful eloquence, his hypnotic style. For example, the style of the Confessions, which is a book very difficult for anyone to put down, a book which has had more effect, I think, upon readers than almost any similar work of art that was ever produced. But then, it was it really nothing new in what Rousseau said? Was it really simply old wine in new bottles? Some say it was because previous thinkers addressed themselves to reason, whereas Rousseau addressed himself to sentiment. But that's scarcely true. There's plenty about sentiment in Diderot and Helvetius, in Shaftesbury and Reynald. They're always saying that so far from suppressing men's feelings, as the austerer religions always demanded, and philosophers like Plato and Spinoza also, man must not curb or maim his spontaneous nature. Certainly the emotions have to be canalized or guided, but they must not be suppressed. On the contrary, more than any other thinkers who ever lived the school of rational, rationalist, so-called rationalist thinkers in the 18th century stressed the value of feeling, stressed the value of human spontaneity and warmth. No writer is more passionate and indeed more sentimental in that subject than, for example, Diderot. Whereas, if we look at Rousseau's writings, to all appearance, the opposite is the case. Rousseau is not at all in favor of sentiment. On the contrary, he says, and he has a great philosophical tradition behind him, that sentiments divide people, whereas reason unites them. Sentiments, feelings, are subjective, individual, vary from person to person, country to country, climb to climb, whereas reason is one in all men. There are certain questions about morals and about politics, how to live, what to do, whom to obey, to which many conflicting answers have been given by the accumulation of human feelings, prejudices, superstitions, odd causal natural factors which have made men say now this, now that. But if we are to get the answer, if we are to obtain the true answer to this question, then this is not the way to do it. We must ask the question in such terms as make it answerable. And that can only be done by means of reason. Just as in the sciences, a true answer given by one scientist will be accepted by all other scientists. Equally reasonable, so in ethics and politics, the rational answer is the correct answer. The truth is one, and, there are, and error is multiple. This is all perfectly commonplace. Few philosophers have failed to say something of the kind. And Rousseau simply repeats his predecessors in saying that it is reason which is the same in all men and unites emotions which are different and divide. What then was it that was so very original? His name is, of course, associated with the social contract, but there's nothing new in that. The notion that men in society, in order to preserve themselves, have had historically to enter some kind of compact, or if not historically, at any rate behave, as if they had done so, that men in society, because some are stronger than others, or more malevolent than others, have had to set up institutions whereby the weak majority is able to prevent the strong minority from riding roughshod over them, that is an idea certainly as old as the Greeks. What then is it that Rousseau added to this idea? Well, some might say he effected a reconciliation between individual liberty and the authority of the community. But then this was the question which had been discussed times out of number by his predecessors. Indeed, the whole, 
the central question which occupied thinkers like Machiavelli and Baudin, Hobbes and Locke, was this very question. Nothing is more familiar or more natural in the history of political thought than the question how men's desire for liberty can be reconciled with the necessity for authority. It is clear to all political thinkers that individuals desire to be free. That is to say, they desire to do what they want to do without being prevented from doing it by other people or coerced into doing something they don't want to do. And that this is one of the chief ends of values for the sake of which people are prepared to fight and which um, one of the values uh, which is necessary for the purpose of leading the kind of life which above all they wish to lead. On the other hand, of course, um, there is uh, the necessity for organized existence. Men live in society for whatever reason, and because men live in society, individuals cannot be allowed to do whatever they like, because this may get in the way of other people and frustrate their ends. Therefore, some kind of arrangement has to be made. Well, if, among past thinkers, this very central problem led to various answers. It led to answers which varied to some extent in accordance with the view of the individual taken by these various thinkers. Hobbes, who took a rather low view of human nature and thought that man on the whole was bad rather than good, thought that a great deal of authority was necessary in order to curb the naturally wild, unruly and bestial impulses of man and therefore um, drew the frontier between authority and liberty in favor of authority. He thought a great deal of coercion was needed to prevent human beings from um, destroying each other, from ruining each other's lives, from creating conditions in which life would be nasty, brutish, and short for the vast majority of society. And therefore, he uh, left the area for liberty somewhat small. Locke, on the other hand, who thought on the whole that men were more good than bad, thought it wasn't necessary to draw the frontier quite so far in favor of authority, and thought that it was possible to create a society in which those rights, which according to him, men possessed while they were in the state of nature, were still to, to some extent, some of these rights that is, retained by men even in civil society, and allowed men a good many more individual rights than Hobbes did on the ground that they were more benevolent by nature and that it wasn't necessary to crush them, coerce them and restrain them to quite the severe degree demanded by Hobbes in order to create that minimum of security in which alone society can survive. But the point I wish to make is that the arguments between them is simply the argument of where the frontier is to be drawn and the frontier is a shifting one. In the Middle Ages when political thought was largely theological, this took the form of uh, disagreement about whether original sin, which made man wild, wicked, savage, and unruly, was something stronger in him than natural reason or God-given reason, which made him seek after good and proper ends, implanted in him by God. In m more secular ages, when these concepts became insensibly translated into secular terms, uh, the same argument occurred with regard to where the frontier was to be drawn. And the question was, how much liberty, how much authority? How much coercion, how much individual freedom? And you simply arrived at the solution in accordance with what seemed to you to be the uh, truth about human nature and perhaps such scientific data as the influence of climate, of environment, and other factors which a thinker like Montesquieu, for example, takes into such great consideration. Now, the original aspect of Rousseau's teaching is that this will not do for him at all. His notion of liberty and his notion of authority are very different from those of previous thinkers. And although he uses the same words, he puts into them a very different content. And this, indeed, may be one of the great secrets of his eloquence and of his immense effectiveness. Namely, that while he appears to be saying things not very different from his predecessors, using the same words and apparently the same concepts, yet he alters the meanings of the words, he twists the concepts in such a fashion that they produce electrifying effect upon the reader, who is insensibly drawn by the familiar expressions into wholly unfamiliar country.